Now I know what you're thinking. Oh no, another EQ car by Mercedes-Benz. Mercedes make some butt ugly electric cars, don't they? I mean, some of the worst. They're like soap bars that have been minimally carved into the shape of a car with some wheels. Utterly boring on the outside, but to be fair, superb on range, luxury and technology. But today's car that we're looking at, which is the EQE SUV, is actually the most normal looking of the bunch. And I actually quite like the way it looks. So it's a good first step towards maybe the electric Mercedes-Benz that we've been waiting for. Today, we're gonna to be testing the mid-level variant, which is the EQE 500 formatic, around about 400 horsepower, nice mid-level, mid-size SUV. I'm gonna show you exactly what powers this car, the new stuff that the EQE SUV brings to the EQ range. We'll also talk about the AMG variants, how much power they have, what makes them unique, and then take this for a drive and see what the EQE SUV is like on the road. Is it the perfect EV SUV daily that we have been waiting for? Let's find out today as we drive the EQE SUV. So guys, today's episode of RBR is once again sponsored by my favorite wallet company, The Ridge. But wait, this isn't about wallets. They don't just make wallets anymore. They've taken their same attention to detail to other products now. For example, they've just introduced what is the Ridge Ring and the brand new Ridge Watch that I cannot wait to show you. So guys, I've got a full selection of the Ridge Rings here. It comes in a nice rugged box, as you can see here. We're gonna start with the one that matches our wallets best, which is the 3K carbon fiber. Every ring has a beveled edge and then a convex inside to make it super comfortable, as you can see, and is designed to really work with you regardless of what you're doing, whether it's heavy duty work or just casual wearing. And then every box comes with an extra silicon ring as well. There's a ton of different styles like this gorgeous navy blue with the chamfered edge, and it's got some real heft to it. Speaking of heft, this one, the gold. I did not expect to like this one as much. And they have this amazing lost and resizing protection plan so even if you lose your ring or you gain or lose weight, you get the option of two future exchanges for the same ring. How brilliant is that? So guys, that's the new Ridge ring available in a host of different materials with that replacement plan as well is pretty cool. Now, if you go to my link, make sure you use the link. It's ridge.com forward slash RBR. My code won't work, so you need to use the link, which is ridge.com forward slash RBR. Can't recommend this enough. I can't wait to show you more of the watches as well. Please do support our regular sponsors. You've seen how much we've used these guys because they're awesome. Now, back to the episode. So guys, the Mercedes EQ family is growing. The last one we drove was the EQE. It's literally grown into the EQE SUV, which is actually a little bit shorter than the EQ. We'll talk about size and stuff as we go on this review, but it is basically a mid-size SUV. Pretty much one of the last cars of this particular platform in terms of the electric platform before it moves into the future generation of stuff based on like the EQXX. But before we dig deeper into it, the first thing I wanna look at is the design because I actually think, like I said, it's the most normal, traditional kind of looking EQ car out of the bunch. And thus for me personally, the most attractive in terms of actually considering whether you'd wanna buy one of these. So let's first take a look at the design, which as you can see, compared to something like EQE, is just a lot more normal looking. You've got, you know, a more defined bonnet rather than that one bow hull design. Yes, the one bow still exists, but it's less obvious in this car. You've got more of a, a longer bonnet. You've got a flatter front end. You've got a more defined greenhouse. You know, the, the shoulders of the car a bit more defined. The off-road black wheel arches really help kind of define and break up some of the bulk that is so inherent with EVs. So this is all a good start, you know, visually, you're kind of reducing bulk, you're kind of reducing that egg shape and making things look all a little bit more familiar to what we're used to. Now, let me take you around the AMG line and let's look at some of the finer details. So I thought we should have a look at the design of the EQ SUV cinch. I actually don't mind it. I don't mind it. I think it's, it's just a bit more normal looking. You can particularly see that, you know, with the you know, slightly longer bonnet, more defined greenhouse at the back. I think the arches, like I said, I think they really break up the whole thing. Of course, you've got the very aerodynamic door handles here, which sit in and out. This thing here on the wheel arch, a lot of people wonder what it is. 
it's actually to fill up your washer fluid. A very clever place to put that. Massive, massive 22 inch wheels on the AMG line that I really like the look of those actually, they're quite nice. They look better in person than what the press shots would suggest. One thing that I actually think helps immensely is the side running boards, particularly for that SUV look. Yeah, it does look quite hatchback-like from there though, doesn't it? Doesn't it remind you of like a, a GLA or something in that kind of stance, particularly because they've gone for this whole, you know, crossover -y type roof line on the back. I'm not convinced by that. I think if it was more SUV looking on the rear, more estate looking, it might be even better. There are some nice little like defined cuts around the lights here. Like I like this. I've got like an integrated spoiler on the light here. Um, you know, fake vents, unnecessary. Little exhaust pieces at the back that aren't real. The breakup of the rear diffuser there as well. It looks, it looks okay. I don't mind it. It's still all very EQ, but you know, just enough normal that I think I can swallow it. So that's the design of the EQ SUV. I actually think it's quite nice, like I said. Um, if we compare it particularly to an indirect predecessor, which was the EQC, that was a truly horrific looking car, wasn't it? Loosely based on the GLC, just an awful, awful looking thing. This, I kind of like it. I kind of like it. The other comparison I want to make here is actually GLE to something a bit more familiar in terms of mid-size SUV, because it's a very similar size. It's slightly smaller than GLE, but actually basically has the same internal room, both in the front and in the rear and almost in the boot, which I'll show you later as well. So keep that as your guideline as, the, as to the type of size that the EQE SUV is versus other cars. Now in terms of design, also bear in mind the type of cars that this is gonna be going up against, particularly direct rival, the BMW iX, which is a zany thing. So just bear that in mind when you're considering the design of this thing. Now my favorite bit, which is stripping away the skin of this thing and understanding how the car works. Now every single EQ SUV has a 96 kilowatt battery at the base of it. And they also use magnet based permanently synchronous motors with a six phase design, two windings and three phases each. The first of these cars, which is the 350 plus only has one on the rear. And this is a rear wheel driven EQ SUV. So it's the lightest of the bunch by about 150 kilos. And this car produces 292 brake horsepower and then the rear wheel drive an eye wateringly slow zero to 60 to seven seconds. Or you can get an additional motor on the front in the formatic version, zero to 60 goes up to six something seconds. So a little bit better. The car that we're testing today is of course the 500 formatic, which has got more powerful motors, both in the front and in the rear. And that produces around about 400 brake horsepower and a more sensible zero to 60 of around five seconds. Now, the other thing that the EQ SUV brings into the EQ family that will get rolled out across the rest is decoupling the front axle for efficiency gains, around about five to 8%. And it happens without the driver knowing, so it's totally in the background depending on driver data, but then it'll decouple the front and it'll only use the rear when needed, thus giving you a nice range boost. So that's great. In terms of suspension, we've got a four link front suspension and a multi-link rear suspension. You've got aromatic suspension as an additional option which we have on our car today with the continuously adjustable damping. And then if you go into off-road mode, you get the 30 mil height increase as well. And then finally, rear axle steering of up to 10 degrees, which has actually been utterly amazing in terms of in-town maneuverability on a car that feels massive when you're driving it, but then shortens so much thanks to the rear wheel steering. Now, like I said, the 500, despite being a 500, is actually the mid-level of what you can get in EQE SUV because AMG have got two variants as well, EQE 43 and 53. And I'd like to show you around one of those right now. Right guys, so standing in front of me is the EQS 53. Let's get straight into it because there's not a lot of differences. First one is obviously the grill on the front. You've got the, you know, the EQ style of AMG Panamericana grill, which is essentially still that black panel, but you've got the little uh, chrome lines going through it with the AMG badge. The rest of the front end, pretty much identical to the EQE 500 that we're looking at today, because that is, of course, AMG line. Smaller wheels on this, which looks a little bit odd. It doesn't really help the shape. It needs those big 22 inches. And you'll also notice that we've got the colored wheel arches around the AMG, and that's the only way that the AMG comes. And of course, this is a formatic car. And then we come around the rear. Again, hardly anything different. Even the trims for the fake exhausts at the back are exactly the same. You have got a proper AMG badge, but then a normal EQ badge. 
for the EQE53 part, which is weird. But yeah, I don't think the small wheels help it. It looks even more hatchback-like. So yeah, they're not really changed a lot in this AMG version because it's just a 53. They're not even going up to 63 with this. Now, let's jump inside the car and I'll show you the differences in the AMG version. Right, let's jump in. Love the little AMG intro within the drive select unit. Right, here we are inside. Now, the main difference is your AMG drive control units here. As I already showed you here, you can change your driving modes with them or we can use the specific AMG button here. And then you've got the additional toggle on the side, just like in the petrol cars, we can change your sound, your dynamics, your suspension, etc. So all of that, just like your normal AMGs. Up here, we've got unique screens for the AMG version. So Super Sport and Track Pace, same with the HUD. The rest of the screens are the same. And then if we go in here, again, just like your petrol cars, you've got AMG performance with energy flow, electric motor, power readouts, etc. And of course, oh wait, here's my favorite one, the IWC app, absolutely love this. So virtual IWC clock in there, which is so cool to play around with and nothing else. And then we've got within the settings, you will see that you can of course change your dynamic select um, and then save that with an individual. And of course, sound experience, you get two different versions and you'll be able to download more as well. So we've got authentic and performance. And of course, the additional side screen as you'll see in our car today. So those are the main changes in the AMG version. Now let's go and check out the other one. So EQE53 is a powerful thing. It's 685 brake horsepower, 0 to 60 in 3.5 seconds, 1,000 newton meters of torque. This is all done with AMG specific electric motors and battery management so you can get that power consistently. Of course, AMG active ride control suspension, making the car even more rigid. I experienced this car at Immendingen and the launch control was absolutely insane. So expect this to be way more dynamic than the car that we will be driving today. Speaking of which, we need to drive this thing and see what it's like to actually live with for a day or so. Before that, I have some words about the interior. Okay, we need to talk about this hyperscreen stuff, which I'm not convinced about. And I wanna show you the very, very roomy interior and boot of this EQE SUV. Now, before we jump inside, the EQE has this thing called sound experiences, and it's to do with driving and all sorts of stuff to do with owning the car. For example, unlocking it. I'm sure you heard that. You get this kind of, can you hear that? Almost like music playing. Now you can turn all of that stuff off if you want. And there's another sound when you turn the car off as well. I like that. I like these affirmative kind of, you know, audible cues as to what's going on with the car. And that continues actually when you turn the car on, off and when you're driving it. And we'll talk more about that as we go along the review. Right now, now as we approach the EQE SUV to get in, the door handles will detect the key and open up for us. Then in tick pickle Mercedes style, you get a nice welcome logo specific to EQ. And this is the interior of your EQE SUV. So of course this uses the famed hyper screen, which is basically, it's not one screen, even though they try to make it look that way. It is a triple screen in one pane. Sorry, that's, that's my, who doesn't like a bit of danger zone? But we can't play that for copyright reasons. So yeah, three screens. Um, in this large singular pane of glass. One for passenger over there, which you can actually add your own wallpaper now. So you can add pictures of your family or your dog or like your favorite combustion car maybe in there. Um, but yeah, so we've got these three screens that we can interact with. I'm gonna show you actually how that one's become a lot more useful in a minute with regards to watching content and movies and that kind of stuff with their built-in headphones. So stay tuned for that. But the hyper screen has been an interesting one to live with. I'll talk a little bit about it when we drive with the car. Generally, I found it to be information overload, particularly in navigation, going around in the country. And we'll talk more about that. I, th I, just, think there's, I just think there's just too much going on on this particular screen. And my first impression, as with other EQ cars, is that this entire dashboard structure is so huge and so high. This is kind of, if I explain to you, it's kind of above chin height for me, this, which is very high, okay? And then it's all bulbous at the back here as well. And while the car, as we said, shorter than EQE, shorter than GLE, it feels like a big car because of this. And that's not helpful, I don't think. I think the whole structure 
is just too overpowering. And you kind of see just how high it is as you follow this line and it can, you know, keeps going upwards. That being said, the material finish is lovely. You've got this rose gold trim that is on all the EQEs that goes across the car. And this of course features the wonderful ambient lighting across it as well. So we can change that to a more exciting color and it flows across the car here. In terms of the hyper screen, this area here is your zero layer. And you can switch this between two ways, either having dynamic widgets like it's currently set, or you can have the standard features always at the bottom, which I think is actually a much more clever way to do it because it's less information overload. I've only learned that as I've used this car and live with it a little bit. So that is a better way because look, you always have your menu options here, which is so useful. And then the navigation is knocked back a little bit without that satellite nonsense as well. So now we have Mercedes EQ specific screen showing your battery charge, etc. That's quite high. So 95% we've got four, five, nine kilometers of range. So basically we've got almost 300 miles probably on a full 100% charge, which is brilliant, isn't it? For a massive SUV like this, so that's good. You've got range, you've got all different charging programs here that you can set for home and work, etc., to tailor to your liking. So yeah, some really good stuff in here. Then because this is an SUV, you actually have an off-road mode as well, where you can raise the car, as we said, by about 30 millimeters, then you get all the off-road data as we've seen in GLC and probably in the future in the new G-Wagon. Now we come over to our driver zone, which is typical as you've seen in recent Mercedes. You can have different content on here. For example, you've got the sports display, the classic display, the understated one, which takes along the color of your ambient lighting, which is actually a really nice way to do it in the entire car then kind of follows that theme. Or you can go whole hog on, for example, the navigation. So you get full screen maps here. And basically you can tailor this to whatever you want, even in fact the off-road mode, which is lovely, isn't it? Look at that, fantastic. So really good, really optimized for the digital world. Mercedes, as always, absolutely killing this whole experience in terms of getting the digital luxury side of things absolutely spot on. Now, one important thing on the EQ cars is the sound experience. And I'm gonna to talk to you as we shoot off to drive this because you have four different ones. Some of these are downloadable later, like Roaring Pulse, Serene Breeze is a new one that comes with EQE. And each of these have a different startup sound and a different turn off sound, different driving sounds, launch control sounds, etc. And they're all completely different to your own taste, or you can just completely turn it off. Same with the outside sound experience. But I really like this element of the Mercedes EQ cars and they're really killing it versus the competition in terms of electric sound. Popping out for a second and the interior, like I said, very spacious, almost identical in terms of headroom, shoulder room, etc., to your GLE midsize SUV. You've got a massive panoramic roof up there, which is great, really, really airy interior. And that continues in the back where it's really nice and airy, lots of headroom, lots of shoulder room, leg room, etc. It's a nice place to sit in. Then we talk about the boot, which is quite big actually for an EV. It's significant. It's only a hundred liters less than the GLE. So it's around about 530, I believe, or the GLE is 630 or something. You've got space here, loads more at the bottom. Tons of space. Look at that with charging cable as well. This is a good boot. You can get rid, of course, of the luggage compartment cover. And of course you can split fold your seats as well for even more luggage space as you would in a normal SUV as well. So all that kind of familiar stuff that you want in your daily SUV. The heads up display in this is brilliant as well. While you're driving, it's really big and quite clear. There's traffic light assist as well, which is so useful when you're sitting at a set of lights and you can't see them. 360 camera around town has been brilliant. Little things like that really adding to the experience. Now I'm gonna take you inside another car which doesn't have the hyper screen. It's the basic screen, but I think it's way, way better. Now, how's that for a change? To me, this is so much better. It's still well lit up with the ambient lighting and everything, but then the structure of this entire area is broken up so much better. I'm a little bit biased because it reminds me of my SL and the fantastic S-Class, the C206, which has got a lovely interior as well. But I just, I don't know, I can't get along with the hyperscreen. And this, this system here, you know, yes, it might look a bit more basic, but you're essentially getting the same type of content for me, it's not content overload either. It's, you know, just enough in order to use while driving in a safe kind of manner. The maps, etc., look pretty much as good. Your driver zone is a separate piece now rather than, you know, being integrated into that. And I think it actually looks pretty nice. The whole dashboard isn't quite as, it's still high from here. You know, I think this whole kind of 
what I call the mountainous region of these EQ cars in the front is a problematic thing because it makes the car look a lot bigger than it is. But having that to break up the whole thing, to me, just works better. I'd love to know what you guys think. Maybe I'm an old fogey who just doesn't know what he's on about, which is entirely possible, but maybe I'm onto something and I want you guys to tell me which one is better. Now, first and foremost with EVs, a lot of them just don't have a startup sound and luckily the Mercedes ones do. I really appreciate that because I think it's safe when you know when a car is on. You guys know I harp on about this all the time. And similarly, when you turn the car off, you get an affirmative sound that you will learn and you know, okay, the car is actually off. Now, as we discussed, you get different sounds. So if I go into Serene Breeze, there's a different startup sound per mode. Now we're going to go into Silver Waves, which is the first one you get. So that's got a different type of one, sounded more like a Windows PC. And then finally, Vivid Flux. And that was some kind of acid reflux sound, right? We're going to choose Roaring Pulse. That's the sporty one. And off we go in the EQE SUV, potentially the Mercedes EQ car to have, allegedly. Now, we have the best type of roads to test this car on, which are the mixtures of straights and curvy stuff to see just what this car is like. Now, initial driving impressions is, it feels a heavy car. It feels a lot bigger than it is. It's, as we said, smaller than a GLE, um, a bit smaller than the EQE saloon. But it feels a larger car, I think, particularly because of, A, its weight, and B, just the sheer mass of the dashboard of the hyperscreen this type of mountainous thing that we have here, it just, it just makes the car feel a lot bigger than it is. It feels like you're driving this giant tank. But then equally, as you get near a corner and then that shorter wheelbase and kind of the rear wheel steer kicks in, and you're able to turn the car, frankly, at you know, ridiculous speeds, um, then you're actually left quite impressed by the dynamism of what is quite a heavy EV. The other great thing about it immediately is the refinement element is so quiet, it's so comfortable. We've got the air suspension here in this version of the car, which is soaking up absolutely anything on the road, not that there is anything on these perfect Portuguese roads, but it feels like we're almost driving a Maybach. You know, that's how refined, smooth, and comfortable this car is. And I think that's what you come to now expect of a Mercedes EV, particularly at this price point. You know, you're paying that much money. It's got to have like near S-Class luxury. Now to properly test dynamics, we're going to put the car into sport mode. So that will tighten up our air suspension, steering, etc., and give us more response on our throttle. So on these EQ cars, your horsepower is limited as well. So when you go into sport, then you get the full amount. I think sport mode definitely helps with the feeling of speed. It doesn't feel as fast as perhaps you would assume something that's called EQE 500 would and the zero to 60 figure doesn't lie about that it's five something seconds which i think is completely accurate if anything it feels quite similar to something like a x5 m50d with an ev like this i often worry is it too fast for the road that's just not the case with this in fact the car very much feels its weight in terms of the speed element um, less so perhaps in the handling because the rear wheel steer the control over the body roll is actually quite good you saw that was a very exaggerated corner there in the car did a very good job of handling it. I really like the acceleration sound, roaring pulse is interesting. We'll go on to the other sounds in a minute. Steering, Mercedes have really got locked down on their formatic cars. Good feedback, rear wheel steer really helps. Look at what I'm doing here. This is crazy in a car this size, but it's got it. I think what it has got is the braking element. First of all, I like that you get a braking sound out of the sound system, that's great. But it just feels we can use bigger brakes. There's just times where it's like squeaky bum time and understeer is happening. There is definitely quite a difference when you go from comfort into sport mode in terms of handling and the steering and a bit more, you know, when you pitch and dive, it's actually quite impressive how dynamic this heavy thing can be. But, you know, you've got to bear in mind it is a heavy SUV regardless. And that higher level of dynamism is only going to come from the AMG. Overall, I think the handling is very impressive for such a large mid-size EV SUV. If you're going to compare it to something like Taycan or you want to, that's going to run absolute circles around this where, you know, this is somewhat getting close to where iX is. I think iX is still a better drive, but then this is 
potentially better looking and more luxurious, so you kind of forgive it that. So manage your expectations in terms of handling. This is something that you will occasionally be driving fast. When you do, you'll enjoy the ambient lighting and the sounds. The handling will impress you in terms of rear wheel steer, but apart from that, it's not what I would call an overtly dynamic SUV. Right, now I've got the soundscapes up. Roaring Pulse was kind of imitating some kind of a big V8 engine. Now we're gonna try Serene Breeze, which is debuting here in the EQE SUV. That sounds like a Harry Potter spell or something. Expelliarmus! It's like you've got music playing. What's all that about? No, I'm not liking that. Let's go into Vivid Flux. Kind of sim like a mix of the two of them. So it still sounds a bit like a car. I actually don't mind this one as much. The the rev, if you like to call it that, the power build-up. That sounds quite nice, so yeah, not bad. That's, that's a decent one. And then finally, the default one, which is Silver Waves. Oh, I quite like that. That sounds very much like a combustion car, but still electric. A nice kind of gargly power build-up. Oh, I might prefer that to the Roaring Pulse. Oh, I really like the acceleration on that. The sound, yeah, Silver Waves is a winner. Now, one thing that Mercedes does really well is using the paddle shifters to control your recuperation. So I put it into strong recuperation and it's almost like downshifting in a combustion car. And that's something that you just don't get in the Taycan. You get this silly little button on the steering wheel that turns on recuperation and it just doesn't feel natural. Whereas this, one press down, you've gone into strong recuperation in the corner and then go back into your normal recuperation. Just feels very natural for a petrol head to do. And then one more click takes you into no recuperation. You kind of coast and you glide. And again, all very natural. You know, the lower down you go, the harder the recuperation is gonna be. Strong recuperation mode also doubles down as one pedal driving, so you don't use the brake. You just let go of the accelerator and the car will brake as hard as it can to recuperate anyway. And then when you wanna go, you just press the accelerator. And that's actually very useful like in traffic situations. Then you hold down either of the paddles and you'll go into intelligent recuperation mode, which then takes your driving data and kind of decides when to recuperate or when to, or when to let you coast, etc. which is quite a clever way of doing it. Far removed from the Taycan, which just has the singular recuperation on or off. Now, initially when I started the car, we had 83% worth of charge and it's estimating us around about 410 kilometers, which is pretty damn good for a 2.6 ton big SUV EV. Now, if you think of that in terms of Taycan, that's around about 250 miles, right? So even at 80%, you're outgunning the Taycan by at least 30, 40 miles when it has a full charge. So that is pretty damn impressive. Now, one thing that's been bugging me while driving this is the hyperscreen. There is just information overload. Now, I'm trying to navigate to the hotel where we're supposed to drop the car off and we've got a bunch of different windows. We've got the zero layer at the bottom here, lots of animations going on in the driver's zone. Another screen over there with the wallpaper, glare hitting this massive screen as well from the sun because it's sunny today. And there's just too much going on. I'm in a foreign country trying to navigate my way and this is just blowing my mind. Whereas, say I'm gonna go back to Taycan again, very minimal information, you know where to look and it doesn't overload you as a new driver. Yes, you may get used to this as you're driving it, but as an initial kind of thing, I think you just won't ever get used to the hyperscreen. I think just too much is going on. Now, one big thing about these future cars from Mercedes is all about content. So for that, I've got my friend here, Irfan, who's kindly agreed to not try to puke while I drive fast in this car. And we're gonna display a new form of content that you can use starting here in the EQE SUV. If we go into apps, we've got video streaming here with Zinc. So we're gonna tap into that. I've got my trusty Mercedes headphones that Irfan's gonna pop on as well. So as we just figured out, actually he has to go into it on this side of the screen. I can't do it, it says content unavailable in here, which is obviously a safety thing. So Irfan's gonna pop on his headphones. Can you hear anything I'm saying? Semi, semi, all right, good. We can kind of abuse him now. So he's watching No Time To Die on there. And the trick here is there's cameras in here that even if I try to a little bit look over there, it's just turned off. Unfortunately, the bloody thing's almost foolproof. You can try and, like, try and... See, I was only just moving my eyes, but it could see when I'm doing it. It's so intelligent. 
bloody pile of crap. So I'm not allowed to watch this film while driving, um, thanks to these cameras fitted in here. But I can ruin the climax for him whenever I look over there. There you go. What do you think of his hat, by the way? Looks like a right nonce, doesn't he? Okay. Shit. <laughs> Where I see this car excelling is just how comfortable it is, the amount of rain you're getting, the fact it looks somewhat like a normal Mercedes-Benz SUV. Yes, it's a heavy car. Yes, the dynamism isn't quite there. A lot of people will appreciate this whole thing more than I do. While I'm not a fan of the form factor, you cannot deny it's miles and miles ahead of most of the competition in terms of content and usability. Out of all the Mercedes EQ cars, I like the way that this one looks from the outside. And that was the problem I had with all the rest of them. And when you're spending this much money on a car, it's got to look okay when you turn back after parking it, right? So in that sense, I think it's the only one that I would personally consider buying. And it does a really good job as a luxury mile cruncher and an EV SUV. As long as you're not expecting dynamism or that much speed at this price point. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this first drive of the EQE SUV. If you have, please do like and subscribe to RBR. I'll see you guys next time.